It's no surprise Richard Watterson is a pretty strong man, despite his uh, looks. But will this strength help him fight his clone? And what would their fight be like? Sidestepping that point, we were able to prove that Richard Watterson is pretty strong about a year ago, except there's just one problem. As many people had pointed out in the comments, this was all in his head, so that's a bummer. But does that mean Richard Watterson really is just weak? And if he fought his clone, it would be like two babies with pillows fighting each other? No, it wouldn't. Because the calculations in the previous video were actually way smaller than what I've just recently been able to find. I was directed to this scene that was recommended to me by many commenters. I'd covered this scene in some of the previous videos, but I missed out on some of the math behind the power of Watterson completely. So let's get an accurate description for the power of Richard Watterson so we can find out how he would stack against this clone and what their fight would be like. So there's one scene that's inevitable here, and that's the universe being teared apart by Watterson getting a job. Since this is the most prominent one, we'll save it for last and move on to the scene that I want to look into. This one, where Watterson hears a mention of a secret burger and rushes to get it. So the cool thing about this scene is the energy, power, and velocity Watterson is traveling at. From the speed camera, it's clear Watterson travels at 200 miles per hour, which roughly translates to 90 meters a second. What we don't know is how long or far he travels for. So we'll assume that the time he's on screen and moving is the time Watterson travels for. If we count the seconds of Watterson running, it comes out to about 17 seconds. If we multiply 70 seconds by 90 meters a second, we find Watterson traveled a total of about 1530 meters. Now, funnily enough, Watterson actually ends up at the mall, but from the wiki, it's stated that the mall borders Canada and the Watterson's house is in California, thus making the trip way more than just one and a half kilometers. So we'll assume that the way big distance is implausible for now and stick with the 1530 meters we got. Now, what does Watterson's speed and distance he traveled tell us about his force and energy exertion? Well, let's get into the math. So Watterson's kinetic energy will be his mass divided by half multiplied by his velocity squared. But the thing is, energy is not conserved in this scenario. So this kinetic energy number may be inaccurate. However, after multiplying out all the numbers, we find that the kinetic energy of Watterson is about 5.5 million joules. Now, the force he exerts to get to the speed initially will be the time it takes him to reach the speed, which comes out to be about two seconds. And we already see him zoom so we'll assume he reaches a 90 meters per second velocity, meaning his force at that point comes out to be about 62,000 newtons, since force is just mass multiplied by acceleration. Now, Watterson actually has two other forces acting on him, so we need to find out the true force he uses to keep himself moving at that speed. Watterson has the force of friction preventing him from moving forward, and the force of air resistance preventing him from moving forward as well. The force of friction with a kinetic coefficient of friction between concrete and a human foot is 0 0.6. Multiplying by Watterson's mass gives us that the force of friction is 816 newtons on Watterson. The force of air resistance can be found by using the equation for the force of air resistance. This equation is force is equal to 1 half rho a c v squared. Taking the coefficient between Watterson and air to be about 1 and the area of Watterson exposed to the air to be about 2 meters squared and the air pressure to be about 1.225 and the velocity of Watterson to be 90 meters a second yields that the force of air resistance on him is about 8100 newtons. Adding the force of friction and the air resistance gives us that the total newtons preventing Watterson from moving forward is around 9000 newtons. Then, the force Richard uses to counteract this force is also 9,000 newtons. Since Richard is consistently applying 9,000 newtons of force over a distance of about 1,500 meters, the total work or energy Richard exerts is then 13.5 million joules of work, since work is force multiplied by distance. Richard's power in this case is his force multiplied by his velocity, which gives us a power of 135,000 watts to move himself forward. To put that into perspective, it's about enough wattage to power 120 California homes. So not insane, but still pretty amazing. Now, some other things that popped out of this result are firstly, Richard's super hearing, since he was able to hear the burger's name selectively from an incredible distance. We can find out just how soft a sound he was able to hear by first finding the decibels of human speech, which is about 60 decibels from about a meter away. 
Then, using the equation for intensity of a sound, we can find out how intense the sound was when it reached Watterson. The intensity of a sound is equal to the sound emitting source's power divided by 4 pi r squared. We can set up two different equations, one for the intensity at the source and one for the intensity at Watterson. We can then divide these two equations and rearrange them to find that the intensity at Watterson is going to be equal to the intensity at Gumball multiplied by the distance the sound is from Gumball divided by the distance the sound is from Watterson squared. Now, we have numbers for these values as 1 meter for the distance the sound is from Gumball and about 1500 meters for the sound from Watterson. The intensity of the sound initially is around 4.03 times 10 raised to negative 10, which we found by converting 60 decibels of speech into an intensity number using this equation. After substituting everything, we see that the intensity at Richard is about 2.63 times 10 raised to negative 13, which when we substitute back into the equation to convert things from intensity to decibels, we have that Richard can hear sounds of about negative 70 decibels. To put this into perspective, this means Richard can hear sounds that are a million times quieter than the quietest sound a dog can hear. He can also hear sounds much, much, much quieter than the sounds in one of these, an anechoic chamber designed to be absolutely quiet. Also, I wanted to find out why Richard's feet weren't on fire, so let's do that now. We can figure out why his feet don't light on fire when we get a clue from the force of friction on Richard, which is about 800 newtons. The work done on Richard's feet by the force of friction is the force of friction multiplied by distance, so around 1500 times 800, which is about 1.2 million joules, if we assume all the work dissipates into heat energy. Now, to find the temperature at which Richard's feet are, we can use the equation Q equals mc delta t. The mass we'll assume to be is the mass of Richard's feet, which is, if we take 1% of his total mass, is around 30 kilograms for both feet. C is the heat capacity of Richard, which we'll take to be around 3470. Then, by solving for the temperature and substituting in our values, we have that the temperature change of Richard's feet is around 12 Kelvin. Then, adding the initial temperature of Richard's feet, which we'll take to be the temperature on a sunny day, which is about 302 Kelvin, we find that Richard's feet after this debacle have a temperature of around 314 degrees Kelvin, or 41 degrees Celsius, which is around 108 degrees Fahrenheit, which isn't enough to cause a fire, so I guess that makes sense why Watterson's feet aren't burning to a crisp. It's also interesting to see that just due to the sheer size of Watterson, his feet weren't able to reach the temperature required to cause a fire to him, but they probably definitely are burned. Also, it's possible the temperature on his feet is higher if we use the equation for the transfer of heat energy, but we'll save that for a different time. Now, to save the best for last, what's going on with the universe manipulation? Now, initially I had a theory that every time he took a step, he'd transport everyone to an alternate dimension, which is pretty cool to think about until you have to start dealing with the math. And then it gets really, really bad. So, I took four notes of what was going on in this video, and they were anti-gravity, time travel, the singularity over here, and the changing of matter. Now, I didn't feel like doing the math and all these, so if it's demanded in the comments, I'll try my best at it. But for now, this universe thing is mainly just a theory. The anti-gravity is not bad to derive since anti-gravity is just a force acting upwards, and for each object in anti-gravity, we can say Richard is the one controlling it. Time travel also is not too bad since Einstein's equations predict that to travel backwards in time, you have to move faster than the speed of light, which is also something we then have. Then we can extend this idea to be that a certain portion of space is disconnected from other portions of space, and that portion of space is traveling a lot faster than the speed of light. But the issue now arises with matter change and singularity, because what is that? Is it the collapse of the universe itself? And for the matter change? So I'd like to think that Richard is out here literally, unironically ripping apart the fabric of the universe. Like, I know that they said it in the show, but it's legit. So I'll just leave the stats of the strength feat to be broken. And I won't even account for the case where if the clone gets this power and then they fought, because then the only thing that could possibly stop them would be Larry. So unfortunately, I'd have to leave out the universe destroying part just due to the subjectivity present in it until the math can be worked out. So with that, let's use the strength of Watterson found from him running. So with those numbers, who would win? If the clone is as strong as depicted in the one episode shown here, without a doubt, Watterson wins. It gets a little more complicated though if the clone is fighting Watterson and has the exact same stats as him as well. For example, Richard can run at 90 meters a second when he wants to, with 1500 kilograms of mass that all ends up leading to a momentum of about 135,000 newton seconds. And depending on how long his attack lasts on the clone, and what the variation of attack, it can be abnormally different the damage inflicted. If the clone was just a split second slower than Richard, and Richard managed to land a hit, then that hit if it was like a normal punch, would have a force around 600,000 newtons, which would hit like a truck. No, I mean like, literally, that's the calculated amount of force a truck would hit on a freeway. 
So if the clone gets demolished, if it's just a split second slower, what about if it's moving exactly the same as Watterson as shown in the episode? It's hard to conclude that this would result in anything other than a tie if they fought physically. However, if Watterson takes an approach of destroying one of his kidneys, he would win. Since we found from the episode that the clone doesn't have two kidneys, since it was getting Watterson's kidney donated to it. Looking at these scenarios, it's pretty hard to call who would win, but from the three cases, it does deliver a decisive victory for Watterson if he plays his cards right. Otherwise, we may be stuck with this, whatever, as the main character going forward with the Amazing Calls of Gumball series.